Hey everybody and welcome back to another video here at Whiteboard Medicine. We appreciate you checking it out. Today we are going to be diving into the interesting topic of ventilator-induced lung injury. This is a critical topic um, for those in um, the clinical world and also is probably interesting for the general public as well. As unfortunately, if you get sick or you get surgery or something else happens, sometimes you do need a ventilator, mechanical ventilation. For those of you new to this channel, this is Channel Whiteboard Medicine. Uh, we cover both public health as well as medical education. This is our homepage. And if you have a particular interest in mechanical ventilation, critical care, or pulmonology, we actually got a bunch of playlists, which we'll link in the video description. This is our mechanical ventilation playlist, and we've got a whole bunch of videos and all things mechanical ventilation. Uh, we're constantly building this up, so we'd love for you to check it out. Uh, we also have playlists on bird flu and some public health things. ARDS was a recent thing we started uh, putting a playlist together on mechanical circulatory support shock. So a bunch of stuff on there. We'd love for you to join us. We also have a, a High Yield Patreon page. We post all the video notes on that page. We also post practice questions um, and the videos without any advertisements, obviously. So if you have an interest or you want to support the channel, we'd love to see you on that Patreon page as well. We'll link it in the video description. No further ado, quick 30-second break for an introduction. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back to talk about Vili. Everybody and welcome to Whiteboard Medicine. We appreciate you checking out the video. Here at Whiteboard Medicine, our goal is to create medical education content for all types of interested learners. That includes videos, practice questions, study resources, and much more. We would love for you to join our community by subscribing, hit that bell button. We're also working to build a high yield Patreon page. It's going to be full of practice questions, video outlines, notes, commercial free content, and much more. None of these videos are intended to be acted upon as medical advice. Please pause the video here and read this disclaimer its entirety. All right, thanks for sticking around. So, ventilator-induced lung injury, or VILI, V-I-L-I. It also goes by the name ventilator-associated lung injury, as folks didn't want it to seem like it was the ventilator causing injury and that you didn't need the ventilator, because obviously you, if you're on a ventilator, it means you need the ventilator. You'd be dead without it. Um, some, so some call it VALI, ventilator-associated lung injury versus ventilator-induced lung injury. But what it is is it's lung injury that's induced or associated with mechanical ventilation. And the reason this happens is mechanical ventilation is not a treatment or a curative for any disease. Mechanical ventilation is simply to buy you time. This is where you get a breathing tube. You have endotracheal intubation, you get put on a ventilator. And that ventilator is essentially what oxygenates you and ventilates you. It gets oxygen in your body and gets rid of carbon dioxide. Um, but to put someone on a ventilator means that they have some pathology that is not allowing them to breathe on their own adequately enough. Maybe it's a terrible pneumonia. Uh, maybe you had a surgery on your neck. Maybe you have uh, pulmonary edema, too much fluid. Uh, maybe you had a seizure and you aspirated into your lungs, right? All those things can cause severe hypoxemia. Maybe you have a really bad COPD exacerbation from emphysema and you're hypercapnic, your CO2 is so high. All those things can lead to respiratory failure requiring uh, mechanical ventilation because the mechanical ventilation buys time while the patient recovers, all right? When you're on a ventilator though, um, obviously, we see this in the clinical arena, there is, um, uh, the ventilator is not your lungs, it's not your body, it's a machine. And although we do everything we can to optimize that machine, it's still not a perfect modality for patients because that machine administers air, it pumps air in and out. And on that machine, we do a lot of settings. We've talked about this in our ventilator, mechanical ventilation lectures, right? We set things like PEEP or the positive end expiratory pressure. We set things like FiO2 or the fraction of inspired oxygen. We set things like tidal volume or the amount of air a patient is receiving with each breath. We set things like respiratory rate, right? The number of breaths the patient is gonna get on the ventilator in a minute. There's even different mechanical ventilation settings, right? There's ACVC, which is assist control. There is ACPC. Oh, apologies, our computer keeps going dark here. Um, or pressure control. There's even weird stuff like APRV, SMIV, lots and lots of different settings. So um, mechanical ventilators are quite complex. And as such, they're not perfect for the lungs. They're needed at times, but they're not perfect for the lungs. And part of that is because you can get ventilator-induced or ventilator-associated lung injury. How does this happen, though? Well, your lungs, just like any organ, have an inflammatory response. They also have tissues. In your lungs, this is what we call an alveolus. Well, I guess this would be alveoli because it's a bunch of alveoluses together, which isn't a word. So this is an alveoli. And these are very thin-walled balloon structures. 
thin walled balloon like structures. Um, and these deflate and inflate to help with gas exchange. And they have these capillaries coating them. So the capillaries uh, pump in deoxygenated blood. So that's blood that is low in oxygen and it's high in carbon dioxide because it came from the rest of the body. And those blood vessels reabsorb a bunch of cardio uh, carbon dioxide from muscles and things. And what happens is the capillary pumps carbon dioxide out into the alveolus and oxygen, right? Because what happens is you have a trachea, bronchi, right? Two lungs. And these bronchi break off into smaller and smaller bronchioles until you get to this, which is kind of the distal bronchial that goes into the alveoli. And what you can see is each alveolus, this is an alveolus, a single alveoli, oxygen is being breathed in to each alveolus, and that carbon dioxide is be, being uh, uh, from the capillary out into the alveolus. So let's say this again. The carbon dioxide from the body goes into the capillary along the alveolus, and it puts pumps carbon dioxide into the alveolus. Oxygen from the lungs into the alveolus comes in here and then diffuses into the capillary. So O2 goes into the capillary to then be distributed to rest of the body, right, to deliver oxygen to the rest of the body. And then all this carbon dioxide now, right, all the oxygen went into the capillary, all the carbon dioxide went out into the alveolus. We then breathe out the carbon dioxide which this is a single alveolus, so it would then go into the alveoli, go into the bronchioles, all the way into the bronchi, trachea, and then out the mouth. And you'd breathe that carbon dioxide back out into the world. It's supposed to say CO2. And the process goes on and on and on with each breath. But when you're on a ventilator, what's happening is the ventilator is pumping that air in and out of the trachea, bronchi, bronchioles into the alveoli. And what happens is when you have lung disease, you get different areas in your lungs that kind of are patchy and collapsed. And it's really important for this alveolus to be kind of perfectly inflated because if it's under inflated or if it's over inflated, all this can cause damage to these really thin walled alveoli. And Different parts of the lung experience different pressures. If I have pneumonia in one part of the lung, that might be experiencing things differently than the part of the lung that doesn't have disease. So when you're on the ventilator, patients can get damage from the ventilator by no fault other than it's an imperfect modality to their alveoli. And that is what ventilator-induced lung injury is. Because once these start to get damaged, you start to get immune cells that come in here and cause inflammation. You get damaged to these alveolar capillary barrier, that epithelial endothelial barrier, gets disruption of the tight junctions, destruction of the glycocalyx, you get capillary leak into the alveolus, so then you start to get some proteinaceous fluid in here, um, and this can eventually uh, be associated with things like ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, which we've talked a lot about. But what types of ventilator-induced lung injury are there? Well, there's, there's several, and the way we like to categorize them is based on the amount of distension of the alveolus. So this is a graphical representation, all three of these, of alveoli and the amount of distension they have, because these are small balloons. So when we take a breath in, our alveoli expand. When you're on a ventilator, you set how much pressure and air someone is getting in. And you want to target this optimal distension of the alveolus. It's like a balloon, right? If a balloon is too filled, you start to put stress on those walls and it can pop. Alveoli don't necessarily pop, but you get the picture. If the balloon's underfilled, it's kind of all collapsed down. And then every time you get a breath, it has to re-expand. So if we think about the different types of ventilators, different types of ventilator-associated lung injury, the first is something we call atelectrauma. Atelectrauma is from the word, let's see, what color should we use? Let's use this one. From the word atelectasis, which is kind of lung collapse. And atelectotrauma ha happens when the alveoli are not distended enough. They're too collapsed. And what happens is every time you pump a breath in on the ventilator, then they have to kind of open up and expand and they collapse back down and open up and expand and collapse back down. And this can lead to damage um, from kind of shear stresses and things on that thin alveolar wall, as well as neighboring uh, and adjacent alveoli and small airways. And that trauma is called atelectotrauma.
Um, sometimes people call it cyclical atelectasis. And the way to try to improve this, and if this is a concept that is not making sense, um, what we're about to say, we'll point you to a video on this page that'll help you, but you need to optimize the PEEP. So on a ventilator, we said there's several different things you set. PEEP is one. FiO2 is another one. Tidal volume is another one. And a respiratory rate is the fourth. And you can set a bunch of other stuff too, but these are kind of the four main ones. And if you are unfamiliar with these four concepts, we'd encourage you on our page, if you go to that mechanical ventilation uh, playlist, and again, we'll post on the page. Oop, we're going to play something on accident now. Let's X out of that. And we did it again. Let's see, strike two. Maybe we're just trying to manipulate you into playing videos. Um, no thanks. But there's a basics of mechanical ventilation that explains all of those things. Um, so definitely check this video out and then come back to the ventilator-induced lung injury if this is kind of not making sense to you. So you want to optimize the PEEP because your goal is you want to try to get that alveolus to a perfect amount of distension. You want to stop under distending it because that will then help get rid of any atelectic trauma. All right, there's also this concept known as biotrauma. Biotrauma is where um, the lung from kind of injury and stress starts to release inflammatory mediators. And biotrauma can happen even when you're optimally distended because the immune system goes all throughout the body. So the immune system, if it's activated by something else, still can get to the lungs and cause biotrauma. But biotrauma gets worse when you have ventilator-induced lung injury from other causes. So let's say you have atelect trauma or you have barotrauma, which we'll talk about. That trauma to the alveoli also causes an inflammatory response and more inflammatory mediators. So the treatment for this, and as you can see, we're kind of putting treatments. Uh, we put treatments in this blue color. Um, the treatment for these is maybe steroids, right? Steroids might work for biotrauma from ventilator-induced lung injury. And it's somewhat extrapolated from the ARDS literature, the Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome literature, which again, we're just doing so many shout outs now, I suppose, but we also have that playlist on ARDS. Let's, we're just gonna click on that too. Boom, I won't click on any of the videos though. Um, and one of those is management strategies where we talk all about different management. Um, but steroids for biotrauma, extrapolated from the ARDS literature, may be effective in treating that. There's also this confusing concept of ergotrauma, and we're not going to spend much time on this, but this is the idea that on prolonged high mechanical power, so you're on a ventilator and your body's experiencing a certain amount of mechanical power from that ventilator, um, complex topic, even if you have optimal distension of the alveoli, you still can have ergotrauma over time just from your lung tissue absorbing all that mechanical power from the ventilator. And getting someone off the ventilator as quick as you can is the best thing to prevent this, but also optimizing driving pressure and respiratory rate, two concepts that are probably a little complex. Respiratory rate is obvious. That's how many breaths you get per minute. And the more time you're having the ventilator give a patient a breath, the more exposure they're having to the ventilator's mechanical power. And then driving pressure is related to optimal alveolar distension. We're probably not going to dive too deep into it in this lecture, um, but just know that it also contributes to mechanical power. So we talked about now for under distension at electrama, which is that repeated opening and closing of an under distended alveolus um, that leads to injury of that, but also injury to neighboring alveoli and small airway. And what you want to do is you want to try to optimize the PEEP best you can to uh, have this under distended alveolus become optimally distended. But then we talked about how even with optimally distended alveoli, you can still get biotrauma, that inflammatory response in the lungs that causes direct damage to the alveoli. And that's usually worse when the lungs under more stress. So if you have other types of ventilator induced lung injury going on, it can increase the amount of biotrauma. But even if you have an optimal distension, you still can get biotrauma. We then talked about ergotrauma, which is when just that lung is exposed to prolonged periods of mechanical power from that ventilator. And respiratory rate, higher ones for prolonged periods of time can lead to this because every time you get a breath, it is the mechanical power from the ventilator is being experienced by the lung tissue. Now we're going to talk about over distension. This is when the alveoli is too quote unquote inflated, just like a balloon is over inflated. This is over distended. And this can lead to two associated things, barotrauma and volutrauma. And barotrauma is baro and trauma, high pressures. If this uh, overdescended alveoli, if the alveolar uh, tissue is experiencing high 
pressures, it can cause barotrauma because that causes stress on that alveolar wall. And that's why we often target, again extrapolated from the ARDS literature, a plateau pressure less than 30 and a driving pressure less than 15. And these two concepts are concepts we talk about in other videos in our mechanical ventilator series. You also get exposed to volume trauma when you're over descended, and that is just that that um, alveolus is getting too much volume. Every breath a patient is getting is pumping in too much volume that is over distending that alveolus. And that's why we often try to target when you're on a ventilator lower tidal volumes, less than six cc's per kg of ideal body weight to limit the amount of volume trauma that patient ex is experiencing. And these are the primary types of ventilator-induced lung injury, um, as well as their kind of simplified uh, management strategies. So what to know here is that ventilator-induced lung injury does occur, and there's ways we can try to minimize it with the strategies we talked about. And if we use those strategies, Hopefully, we can bridge people, get them the treatments they need, and then get them off the ventilator as quickly as possible because we never like to leave anyone on a ventilator uh, longer than their lungs are absolutely demanding. So hopefully that was educational. Let us know what thoughts, comments, questions you have down below. Subscribe, hit the bell button, check out our Patreon page. Uh, you can find these video notes on there. Uh, either way, we appreciate you all. Stay well, keep learning. We'll see you next time.